Shirley Holmes and the Lithuanian Case by Jennifer Bassett Chapter 1 A Missing Daughter Somebody is ringing my office doorbell. It's ten past nine on a Monday morning. That's early for a client to call. But perhaps this is going to be a good week. Last week, business was not very good. I need some new clients. I look at my computer. I want to see the person before I open the door. The little camera over the door shows me a woman in a raincoat. About 40 maybe, not rich. The raincoat is a cheap one from the street market. She's carrying a newspaper, the Putney Gazette. I hit the open door button on the wall. The door opens and the woman comes in. Are you the private investigator, Shirley Holmes? She asks. She looks around the office, probably looking for someone older. I am. I use my older person voice. Please sit down. Mrs. Er, Williams. Edith Williams, she says. She sits down in my best chair and looks around the office again, still looking for that older person. How can I help you, Mrs. Williams? I say. What's your problem? She looks at me then, and the trouble in her face is clear. Do you find people? She says. Can you find my daughter? She left home five weeks ago, just walked out, took all her things and walked out. And not a word from her, no phone calls, not even a text, nothing. Edith Williams is nearly crying now. Why? I ask. I'm careful. Family problems can be dangerous. You open a door and all kinds of dark and horrible things come out. And when those dark and horrible things are out, you can never put them back in again. Edith Williams is still trying not to cry. Why, Mrs. Williams? I say again. Why did your daughter leave home? Was there an argument? Not with me, no. It's her father. He... Now she really is crying. Five weeks of crying, all in two minutes in my office. I get her a cup of coffee and sit on a chair next to her. Tell me all about it, Mrs. Williams. Take your time. The daughter, Carrie, is 15, I learn. She likes boys, has lots of boyfriends, doesn't listen to her parents. So what's new? Many 15-year-old girls are like that. But the new boyfriend, Edith Williams says, is older, and he's not English. He's a foreigner from Lithuania. I remember my Ukrainian grandmother, my Greek mother, foreigners. Is that a problem for you? I ask. A foreigner? Not for me, but it is for my husband, Edith Williams says. He doesn't like foreigners. They come here, he says. They take our jobs. They take our houses. They take our money, and they can't speak English. He gets very angry about it. He says some horrible things to Carrie. I don't want this foreigner in my house, he says. And Carrie goes crazy. She calls her father some horrible names, and he gets really angry. He's shouting, and Carrie's crying. They don't stop for hours. Edith Williams stops for a second. She can still hear the shouting and the crying, I think. And what happened next? I ask quietly. The next day, Mrs. Williams says, Carrie left, early in the morning, before we all got up. She left a letter. Have you got the letter? I ask. Yes, I have. She gives the letter to me, and I read it quickly. An angry letter from an angry 15-year-old. Nothing useful. I give the letter back to her. I asked all her friends, Mrs. Williams says, everyone. They didn't know, or they didn't want to tell me, and she stopped going to school. What about the police? I ask. I can't go to the police. My husband doesn't want to see her again. We can't even say her name at home. We? Who's we? Me and Darren. He's Carrie's little brother. He's ten. He's very unhappy about all this. I must meet Darren. Ten-year-old boys can be very useful. They see and hear a lot. Edith Williams looks at me with her red eyes. Can you find her for me? I just want to know she's all right. And this boyfriend, this Lithuanian, what's he like? How old is he? What does he do? Is he kind? Is he the right person for my little girl? 
I take the job. I ask for a photograph of Carrie, the names of friends, the school, mobile phone numbers. Can I talk to Darren? I ask. Yes, we can meet him after school, Edith Williams says. But please don't come to my house. Please, my husband. I understand, I say. I can text you when I have some news. She doesn't know the name of the Lithuanian boyfriend. That's really helpful. There are thousands of Lithuanians in London. Finding one young man without a name and thousands of people? How easy is that? Chapter 2 Help from Friends I begin with Carrie, of course. I have a name and a photograph and a school. I meet Darren when he comes out of school, and we go to Carrie's school. We sit in my car and watch the students when they leave. That's Janice. Look, says Darren. The girl with long black hair. She's very friendly with Carrie. And that's Kim next to her. I like Kim. She's funny. She makes me laugh. Ooh, and that's Aunt. See, the one with very short hair and black clothes? Aunt? What name is that? Anthea? Don't know, says Darren. She's just Aunt. I take a quick photo of the three girls, and then I take Darren for a pizza to say thank you. Can you find my sister? He says. It's horribly quiet at home without her. Nobody ever laughs now. Mom cries all night. I hear her. I look at his small boy face. Yep, I can find her. That evening, I phone my friend in the police. He's a detective. Detective Sergeant Sahid Patel. Hey, Sahid, how are you? Fine. What's new with you? Sahid says. Are you working on a case? Yes, I've got a missing persons case, a missing girl. Her mother came to me today. The girl left home five weeks ago after an argument with her father about her boyfriend, a Lithuanian boyfriend. How old is the girl? Sahid asks. Fifteen? Oh dear. Sahid is not surprised. Every day we get missing persons reports. Do you know how many? No. Tell me, how many? The police in Britain get about 1,000 reports every day, Sahid says. And nearly one third of those are young people between the ages of 15 and 17. When did the mother make the report to the police? She didn't. The girl's father doesn't want to see her again, I say. So no police, no missing persons report, and no looking for her. That's what the mother told me. Okay, be careful, Shirley. The girl's only 15. She can't get married before she's 16, and the law says, I know all that, Sahid. I know the law. Of course you do. Sorry. There's a smile in Sahid's voice. So what do you want from me? Can you help with the Lithuanian boyfriend? I say. Where do I look for him? Can you give me some names? People to talk to? Maybe. But there are about 200,000 Lithuanians in London. When do you want this? I have work to do, you know. I'm going to try the girl's school friends first, I say. Can you do it in a day or two? Text me when you have something. Okay, bye now. The next day at 4 o'clock, I'm outside Carrie's school. I have my photo of the three girls and I soon see them. They're standing, all three of them, in the street, looking at their mobile phones and laughing. I walk over to them. Hi guys, I say. You're friends of Carrie Williams, right? I need your help. Carrie Williams? Says the girl called Aunt. Who's she? I watch the girls' faces. They know Carrie, all right. And they know she's missing. But how much do they know? Oh, come on, I say. You're Carrie's best friends. I'm looking for her. I need to find her. And who are you? Asked the girl called Janice. I give them my card. Shirley Holmes, private investigator. The girl called Kim laughs. Shirley Holmes? Are you the granddaughter of Sherlock Holmes or something? I smile. I get this all the time, again and again. And again, great-great-granddaughter, he lived in the 1890s. Wow, really? That is awesome, says Kim. Janice and Aunt laugh. Kim, you idiot. Sherlock Holmes wasn't a real person. He's just a detective in stories on television. 
Er, and in books, I say. The books were first. The girls look at me, and their faces are more friendly now. Okay, Shirley Holmes, great great granddaughter of Sherlock, says Aunt. How can we help you? Who are you looking for? What was your name again? Aunt is going to be difficult, I can see that. She's a good friend of Carrie's, and she's not going to talk. Do you have mothers? I say. All three of you? The girls stare at me. Of course we have mothers, says Janice. What are you talking about? Do you love your mothers? Do your mothers love you? I say. Well, listen, Carrie's mother loves her daughter, and now Carrie's mother can't sleep at night. She doesn't eat. She cries about Carrie all the time. She wants to know that Carrie is all right. Can you understand that? She just wants to know. Kim looks at me with big eyes. Oh, poor Mrs. Williams, she says. Aunt gives her an angry look. We don't know Carrie Williams, she says. Remember? Janice looks at me. Give us a minute, she says. We need to talk. They move away, turn their backs to me, and talk quietly. I can't hear them. Then they come back to me. Okay, says Aunt. What do you want? You know Cafe Nero in Putney High Street? I say. Tell Carrie this. I'm going to be in Cafe Nero at 18:30 tomorrow evening, and 18:30 the evening after that. I want to see her and talk to her. I want to know she's alive and well. That's all. Then I can tell her mother, and Mrs. Williams can stop crying all night. Okay, Aunt says. We got it. Thanks, guys. I say. See you around. See you. They say. Chapter Three, talking to Carrie. Carrie doesn't come the first evening. I sit there for two hours and drink a lot of coffee. Five big cups, black, no sugar. It's a good thing I like coffee. But she comes the second evening. I'm sitting with my back to the wall, watching the door. Through the cafe window, I see Aunt in her black clothes. She's walking past, slowly, looking into the cafe. A minute or two later, Carrie comes in and walks over to my table. Red hair, green eyes, no smile. I stand up. Hi, Carrie. I'm Shirley Holmes. Thanks for coming. Have a seat. Can I get you a coffee or a tea? I'm using my head teacher voice. Right, girls, sit down. Open your books. Get to work. I don't want Carrie to have time to think. She doesn't want coffee or tea. She wants to have an argument. I'm not going home, she says. So you can forget that. I don't need my family. I have a new life now. I watch her face, and she stares back at me with angry green eyes. I don't think Carrie is in trouble. Carrie knows what she wants, and Carrie gets what she wants. I think Carrie makes trouble. I begin to feel sorry for the boyfriend. Why are you here, Carrie? I say. What did your friend say to you? She doesn't answer. Just looks at me. Did they tell you about your mum crying all night because her little girl is living on the streets, because her little girl is taking drugs, because her little girl is in big, big trouble? Suddenly, Carrie has a lot to say. I'm not living on the streets, she shouts at me, and I don't do drugs. I never do drugs. Who told you all this? It's not true. People in the cafe turn their heads to look at us. I smile around at everybody. I smile to say everything's fine here. Just a big sister, little sister argument happens all the time. Enjoy your coffee. Have a nice day. I look back at Carrie's angry face. But your mom doesn't know that. I say quietly. At night, when she can't sleep, she thinks about those things. You're only fifteen, Carrie, and it's a big bad world out there. Of course, your mom is afraid for you. Carrie looks down at the table. Yeah, well, she looks up. But I'm okay. I'm fine. You can tell her that. Why don't you tell her? I say. Call her. Text her. Carrie stares at me. Who sent you? She says. Mum? Or was it my dad? Your mum. Look, I'm not texting mum because I don't want my dad to know. 
I don't want to see him again, ever. We're not talking about your dad, I say quickly. I know all about your dad. We're talking about your mom. And your mom needs to know you're all right. But she needs to hear it from you, not me. She texts you every day, you know. And you never text back, never. Kara looks away. I got a new mobile and changed my number. I never got her texts. I laugh. Very good, Carrie. You read detective stories, right? Always change your mobile when you don't want people to find you. Dangerous things, mobile phones. Carrie nearly smiles. Thomas says, she begins, then stops. Is Thomas your boyfriend? I say. The one from Lithuania. Are you still with him? Of course I'm still with him. Carrie's angry again. I love him and he loves me. We're in love. I try not to smile. How wonderful to be 15 and in love for the first time. That's great, I say. I'm happy for you. But please, please text your mom. Tell her you're all right. Okay, says Carrie. This evening. She looks at her watch and stands up. I must go. I'm meeting someone. Thanks for coming, Carrie. And remember that text. She walks out of the cafe, and 15 seconds later, I'm following her. She's walking down the high street, maybe to the bus station. I've got a minute, but I must be quick. A private investigator always needs to carry a big bag. I stop by a shop window and open my bag. Three seconds later, I'm wearing a blue t-shirt over my red t-shirt. In another five seconds, I have a wig on. And my short black hair is now long, blonde hair. Now I'm walking away from the shop window, and I'm wearing glasses. My big brown bag is now inside a small black backpack. No time to change the shoes. Carries a long way down the street. I walk fast, nearly running, and watch her red head in front of me. When I get to the bus station, I can't see her at first, and walk quickly past all the people waiting. She's there, waiting for the number 71 bus. I wait too, about 20 meters away, and I'm reading the evening newspaper with great interest. A private investigator always has today's newspaper in their bag, but Carrie doesn't look around. When the bus comes, Carrie goes upstairs. This is good news for me because I can sit downstairs, at the back of the bus. I can see Carrie when she gets off, but she can't see me. It's a short bus ride, only 10 minutes. Carrie gets off the bus and turns left into a small street. I'm 30 meters behind her. Carrie looks round, once, and sees someone with blonde hair in a blue t-shirt and glasses. She doesn't know me. Halfway down the street, she crosses the road and goes into a big old house. I walk past the house, not too fast, not too slow. I can't follow her into the house because there are no other people around. You can only hide easily when there are lots of people around. I take the next right, walk for 10 minutes, then turn around and come back. This time, I walk to the front door of the big house. There are six bells by the door with names next to them. It's a house with six different apartments. I look at the names, but there isn't a Williams next to any bell. Well, of course not. She is living with her Lithuanian boyfriend. I look at the names again. John Azumba, K. Brown, Lily Sardelli, R. Varnaite, T. Grigas, M. M. Westerbrook. Varnaite and Grigas, Lithuanian names, I think. Thomas Grigas, perhaps? You can't stand in a quiet street and watch a house. Everybody looks at you and says, Who's that woman? What's she doing? But you can watch a house from a car. People often sit in cars, waiting for somebody, having a sleep, checking their phone messages. I go home, make some spaghetti for dinner, and text Edith Williams. Saw C today. She's fine. More tomorrow. Chapter 4 The Boyfriend The next day I'm in the street in my car, opposite the house. I have a cup of coffee, a newspaper, and a lot of time. I want to see Thomas and talk to him. Then I can make my report to Mrs. Williams, and the job is finished. At 5.45, Carrie walks down the street and goes into the house. I'm watching carefully now. People are coming home from work, in cars, on bicycles, on foot. Lots to watch. 
Two people go into the house: a young woman and a short, older man with white hair. At 6:25, a young man walks down the street, tall with dark hair. He walks to the front door, and in two seconds, I'm out of the car, across the street, and standing behind him at the door. He opens the door and turns to look at me. Hi, I say. Okay to come in? I'm visiting Mike Westerbrook at number six. Yes, that's okay. The young man says. He holds the door open for me, and we walk up the stairs together. Nice and sunny today, I say. But rain's coming in later, they say. Hmm, says the young man. At the top of the stairs, he turns to the door with number four on it, gets out his key, and opens the door. Suddenly, I run back to him. Hey, excuse me. Is this yours? It was on the floor. In my hand, I'm holding a weekly bus ticket. It's more than two months old, but he can't see that because I've got my hand over the date. He looks at the ticket, and I look through the open door of number four, and see Carrie in the room. Then I'm through the door and inside the apartment. Hey! The young man shouts at me. What are you doing? Who are you? Get out! I turn to Carrie. Hello, Carrie. I say. Did you text your mom last night? The young man is next to me now. Who is this? He says to Carrie. What's this about? He stares at me angrily. Carrie looks angry too. She's a private investigator, she tells the young man. Mom sent her. I talked to her yesterday in the cafe. I told you, remember? Ah, the young man suddenly smiles. He has a very nice smile. How exciting! I never met a private investigator before. How do you do? I'm Thomas Barnes, and I'm very pleased to meet you. He holds out his hand, and we shake hands. Wrong name, I think. Not the name on the door. But this is the Lithuanian boyfriend. Charlie Holmes, pleased to meet you too. I say, I'm sorry about this, but I need to talk to you. Carrie's mother, of course, says Thomas. I understand. Please sit down. Can I get you some coffee? He and Carrie make coffee, and we all sit down round the table. Thomas looks at me, smiling. So he says, you want to ask me questions, so you can tell Carrie's mother all about me. I'm very happy about that. What do you want to know? Shall I begin? So I listen to the story of Thomas Barnes's life. He's 19 years old and comes from Vilnius in Lithuania. He came to London six months ago because he wants to start a business. His family make linen cloth in Vilnius, and Thomas wants to sell it in England. At the moment, he's working Monday to Friday in a hospital because he needs the money. But he's selling linen in the street market on Saturdays. Business is good and is getting better every week. Carrie wants to tell me more about it. It's beautiful linen, you know, the best in the world. I'm learning all about it. She's excited. I can see it in her green eyes. Thomas is smiling. Carrie's very good with the colors of the linen. He says she wants to work with me, and she's good at business too. Very good, better than me. He puts the back of his hand against Carrie's face, just a touch, a very gentle touch, and smiles into her eyes. She looks up at him. And the love in her eyes is clear. For a second or two, the world stops for them. These two young people are very much in love. Carrie looks at me again. Everybody wants to wear clothes made of linen now, you see. So our business is going to get bigger. Lots of hard work, says Thomas. But we're young. We can work hard. No problem about that. But we do have one problem. He looks at Carrie. Your family. Oh, that. Carrie says, "Not important. I don't need them. We're fine without them." Not so, Thomas says gently. Your mother is unhappy. Your little brother is unhappy, and your father too. No, he isn't. My father is a horrible man. We have arguments all the time. Every day he tells me, "Do this. Don't do that. Do this." He's always right, and I'm always wrong. Always. He never listens to me. He doesn't understand me. He doesn't want to understand me. He's just horrible. Shh, shh, Thomas says. When people are angry, sometimes they say bad things. Maybe they don't really think that. You and your father have a lot of arguments, and you both get angry and say things. Yes, but Carrie says, I sit and listen. This is not their first argument, and it's not going to be their last one. It's interesting to listen to them. 
Thomas is very gentle with Carrie, but he's strong too. He's in love, but he still thinks clearly. Uh, excuse me, I say. I'm still here, you know. They look at me. Thomas laughs. Sorry, he says. We talk about this often. In the end, Carrie must go back home. She knows that. No, I don't, says Carrie. I'm not going back home. No way. But Carrie, you can't cut your family out of your life. Family's important. My family's important to me. And I want you to have your family too, to be friends with your mother and your father and your little brother. They're off again. I'm trying not to smile. This argument is going to run and run. I think Thomas is good for Carrie. Well, I'm done here, I say. It was good to meet you, Thomas. I can tell Mrs. Williams about you now. And, well, good luck to both of you. Carrie smiles. Thanks, Shirley. Can I call you Shirley? Aunt and Janice said you were all right. I sent Mom a text last night, you know. Thomas stands up, too. I must get home now, he says. I stare at him, surprised. Home? You live here in this apartment, don't you? No, 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 Thomas says. Of course not. Carrie's 15. We cannot marry before she's 16 years old. It is against the law. So of course I don't live here. It is not correct. But this is your apartment. No, no, Thomas says again. It's my sister's apartment. Carrie lives here with my sister, Ruta Varnaita. She's working late tonight. I have a room with a friend near Putney Bridge. I'm very surprised. I sit down again and look at Carrie. Why didn't you tell me? Everybody thinks you're living with Thomas. Carrie doesn't look pleased. Well, I didn't tell them that. But my dad always thinks the worst, and sometimes my mom too. But we can get married next year, when I'm 16. Thomas laughs. He pulls her hair gently. Sixteen is still very young to get married. We can wait. I want to know your family first, and you want to know my family. Yes, I really want to meet your family, Carrie says. But you don't want to meet mine. You really don't. Thomas pulls her hair again. Not so gently this time. Of course I do. I want to talk to your father. I want him to like me. We have all the time in the world, Carrie. Let's just take our time, eh? Carrie tries to look angry, then she laughs and puts her arms around him. Thomas and I leave the house together. He walks with me to my car. I'm sorry about Mr. Williams, he says. I think he loves Carrie a lot. Maybe I can meet him and talk to him one day. But Mrs. Williams doesn't need to be afraid for Carrie. Please tell her that. Of course, I say. I've got a lot to say to Mrs. Williams. Thomas and I shake hands again and say goodbye. I drive back to my office and check my messages. There's a message from Saheed. Call me about the Lithuanian boyfriend. I send him a text. Found the boyfriend, thanks. And the girl. All well, no problems. Easy case, nothing horrible. But thanks for the help, SH. A text comes back from Saheed at once. Oh, thanks a lot. I made 12 phone calls for you, all for nothing. Next time, you can help me, SP. Oh dear, Saheed is not pleased. I often need his help, so I must be nice to him. I send him another text. Sorry, really, really sorry. Can I buy you a beer tonight? SH. A text comes back from him. Okay, the King's Arms by the river. Nine o'clock this evening. See you, SP. Chapter 5 A Foot in the Door Sahid and I have a beer together, and I tell him all about the Lithuanian case. A father-daughter problem, eh? says Sahid. Well, I know all about difficult fathers. Sahid is from an Indian family. He and his sister Lila have their problems with a difficult father, too. But Sahid never talks about his problems. He just does his job. He's a good detective. So, you did a good job there. A happy ending, says Sahid. Yes and no, I say. One more thing to do. We finish our beer and leave. Say hi to Lila for me, I say. Lila is my best friend. She's a lawyer. 
Lila, Saheed, and I have a lot of arguments about the law, and the police, and private investigators. We have a good time. I'm always right, of course. The next day is Saturday. I do some work on my laptop in the office and think about the Lithuanian case. How many young men are there like Thomas Farnes? I think about it some more, then I leave and walk to the Williams house. It's not far from my office. Mrs. Williams opens the door, sees me, and tries to shut the door again, but my foot is in the door. Can I come in, Mrs. Williams? I say. Just for a minute. It's Saturday. My husband's at home, Edith Williams says. Please speak quietly. Look, I've got your money ready. Here it is. And thank you, thank you. Carrie is texting me every day now, so I know she's all right. Please go now. Please don't. Who's that out the door, Edith? It's a man's voice, a big, strong voice. Oh, nobody, Mrs. Williams says quickly. But I'm inside the door now and looking at Mr. Williams. Oh, hello. He says, who are you? Shirley Holmes, private investigator. How do you do? Your wife wanted me to find Carrie and to talk to her boyfriend. What? Mr. Williams turns to his wife. What did I say to you, Edith? He shouts. We're finished with that girl. We don't speak to her. We don't talk about her. We... And it's good news, Mr. Williams. I use my head teacher voice again. He's still shouting at his wife, so I shout too and smile and smile. Yes, it's very good news, Mr. Williams. Your daughter Carrie is alive and well and living in London, and she has a wonderful boyfriend. Mr. Williams stops shouting and stares at me. Behind him, I can just see Darren's head. He's looking round the door with big eyes. Carrie's boyfriend is a very nice young man. His name is Thomas Barnes. He's 19 years old. He's a hard worker. He's kind. He's a foreigner, Mr. Williams says angrily. You have a problem with foreigners? I say. Mrs. Williams closes her eyes. She is waiting for something. What? A lot of bad language about foreigners from her husband? I look at Mr. Williams again, but he isn't saying anything. He's just staring at me angrily, and suddenly I understand. His problem isn't with foreigners, it's with his daughter. He wants to know that Carrie's all right. He wants to hear about her boyfriend. He wants to see her, to have her back home. But he can't find the words. He just can't say it. I speak quickly. Thomas is a very nice young man. I say it again. It's an important message. He works hard. He's doing two jobs, and he's going to make a good life for him and Carrie. He speaks very good English, and he's kind, and he's funny, but he's strong too. He thinks family is important, and he wants Carrie to come back home to be friends with her mother, her father, her brother. All three of them are listening to me now. Darren has a big smile on his face. Oh, and Carrie's living with Thomas's sister, not with Thomas, you know. Carrie wants to get married when she's 16 next year, but Thomas wants to wait. He wants to meet the family, and he wants Carrie to meet his family. So you see, Thomas Farnes is a good man, a really good man. He's a boyfriend to please any father in Britain, Mr. Williams. Carrie's father opens his mouth and closes it again. He still can't find the words. So now you know all about him, Mr. Williams. Meet him. Talk to him. Ask him to Sunday lunch. I turn to Mrs. Williams. Do you usually have Sunday lunch? You know, that wonderful British meal? All foreigners love it. Er, uh, yes, she says. I, er, uh, yes. I always do a nice Sunday lunch. Well, there you are then, I say. I smile around at everybody. Sunday lunch. That's a good way to meet your daughter's boyfriend. I take my money from Mrs. Williams give Darren a big smile and a wave and walk to the front door. Nobody's shouting, nobody's crying. So far, so good. Have a nice day, everyone, I say, and close the door behind me. Chapter 6 A Surprise Visitor The next three weeks are busy. I have a new case to work on, and I'm out of the office nearly every day. I don't like the client very much, but the case is an interesting one. On Saturday morning, I'm in the office again. I have a lot of emails to write, so I'm not pleased when my doorbell rings. The computer screen shows me a man at the door. Well, 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 what a surprise. I hit the open door button, and the man comes in. Mr. Williams, good morning, how are you? I say. What does he want? Morning, 
Ms. Holmes is not friendly. He's not unfriendly. He looks around my little room. Nice office, he says. Can you see the river from your window? He walks to the window, looks out. What does he want? Does he just want to talk about my office? Maybe the weather's next. It's colder today, he says. Autumn's coming. I wait. He comes away from the window. Can I sit down just for a minute? Of course, please, I say. Now he looks at me. I just wanted to say, well, you were right about Thomas Varnas. He's a fine young man. I like him a lot. Well, that's great, Mr. Williams. I'm very pleased. So tell me, what happened? He smiles and gets comfortable in my best chair. He wants to tell me all about it. We asked him to Sunday lunch, like you said, and he and Carrie came to lunch and stayed all day. Lots to talk about, he laughs. Me and Carrie have an argument, of course, but we always do. Tom, I call him Tom now, you see, is very good for Carrie. He doesn't get excited and angry like Carrie does, and Carrie listens to him. He laughs again. She never listens to me. <laughs> I smile and say something about the father daughter thing. So, Carrie's back home with us now. Tom comes round every evening, of course, and weekends. He's out with Darren now, playing football. Darren thinks he's wonderful. Thomas is a big brother for Darren, I say. That's right, says Mr. Williams. Oh, and Carrie's back at school too. She wants to do business studies. Then she can help Tom with his linen business. She's got a good head for business, you know. He laughs. My little Carrie, a businesswoman. <laughs> He stands up. Well, you're busy. I can see that. I just wanted to tell you about Tom. I like good news, Mr. Williams. I say, and it was good of you to come. I walk with him to the door. At the door, he says, "You help my family a lot. Maybe one day you need help. Just call me." He gives me his business card. Anything. Who knows? I'm going to remember those words.